We have 35 states in this country that by law must teach teenagers about sexuality. My children, who are 19 and 22, when they were in high school, both learned how to put a condom on a banana. And I hope that that helps them at some point in their life if they're at a party with a lot of bananas and <laughs> they need somehow to be protected. But there are only three states in this country that require financial education for young people. So here you have one of the fractures of democracy, that people increasingly, because of the shifting of the benefit structure, are being left to be responsible for their own long-term financial well-being. And yet we have a culture where people spend more than they earn, where people are leveraged up to the hilt, where people think their homes are ATM machines, and most people simply have not got ingrained into them the idea that saving for your future is essential if you're going to have a future that you want to live in. And I will tell you that not only do I believe that the current systems need to be shored up and protected because there is a serious tsunami coming financially, but we have to educate people, we have to encourage people, we have to motivate people. And this boomer generation, who, is, who has lived one of the benefits in this period of great affluence and prosperity, unfortunately, are excessively optimistic, whereas our moms and dads were excessively cautious. That caution served them well. Our optimism is going to lead to serious difficulties in the years to come. And so the idea that as I'm earning today, part of what I'm earning is to pay for today, for my wife and children and my mom and dad and my brother who I help support, that's for today. But I need to take some of what I'm earning today and plant it in my 70th year, and plant it in my 80th year, and plant it in my 100th year, so that when I reach that point in my life, I will be able to fund the life I'm dreaming of. Or else all this fantasy about the wonderful retirement we're all going to have is simply going to be unaffordable. And who are our leaders on this issue? Who do we even trust? Third, this one really knocked me around for the last five years. I went to Webster's Unabridged Dictionary and I looked up the word retirement and it says, to disappear. And what struck me is that during the 20th century, we have created longevity, we have created old people, we have given birth to an extraordinary age wave, yet we forgot to think about its purpose. And so we have tens of millions of long-lived Americans with the greatest concentration of wisdom, knowledge, and experience in the history of the world doing nothing but watching TV, as I mentioned, 48 hours a week. I think one of the unintended consequences of the institutionalization of old age in 1935, and I believe Social Security was a fantastic innovation, but one of the unintended consequences was that it created a mindset that when you reach 65, you really don't have to do anything anymore except have a vacation. I'm troubled by the fact that there are so many people in their 60s and 70s and 80s who could give, who could share, who could contribute, either for fee or for volunteer, yet we don't invite them back in. We have age discrimination in the workforce that's pervasive even though it's illegal. I'll give you an example. I mentioned it the other day. One of everybody's favorite shows is American Idol. The idea is you can apply, it's the American dream. If you can sing, you can get a contract and you can be a star. Yet you can't be over 28 and apply for that show. That is illegal. Why can't 60-year-olds have a dream of being a singer? Why can't 80-year-olds apply for that job? It's still pervasive ageism in this country. And so many of the programs that we all are so invested in, which are wonderful programs, but the majority of them are programs in which really well-intentioned professional people give something, do something nice for the elders in their community. I think we need the other way as well. How can we create a, a wall of programs so that the elders in this society can contribute, can give back, can teach us, can show us the way, can be our mentors, can be our coaches, can be our elders, can be our leaders? We have not yet created a purpose for retirement. We have not yet created a purpose for aging in this society, and it is absolutely a big missing mistake. And who are the leaders? What is our role in conclusion? Who knows more than we 
who have worked for a year or five or 20 or 30 have seen the problems and the successes, who knows more than we what's coming? And if we all just get together and talk to ourselves, fine. But it's talking to the policemen, it's talking to the financial advisors, it's talking to those crazy loons on television that are financial experts, it's talking to our politicians, but it's also talking to the employers, it's talking to the doctors, it's insisting on aging readiness in a culture that is about to be transformed by longevity. We are the leaders. We must have a vision. We must navigate, we must chart the course and navigate it. We must embrace all the different people who come in contact with aging Americans, not just those of a particular ethnic or racial group, and not just those that are poor, but the entire society is trying to figure out what do we become as we live the longest lives in history. I believe that with our leadership, the great American experiment even gets greater we have the chance to build the bridge to the world's first multiracial, multiethnic, multisexual, multi-lifestyle, multi-generational society. And my two last points are, number one, that will be simply the most extraordinary triumph of history. And number two, for those of you new to the field, I have woken up every single day for the last 35 years and thought to myself, there is no job, there is no work, there is no assignment, there is no field more interesting than what we do and more important to the world in this century than what we do. Thank you.